So one of my favorite things about my grandfather, and will be probably one of the most missed, but will always continue, um, was his initiation of action after conversation. And I loved sitting at the table with him discussing um, dynamics, um, theory, social change, um, evolution, spirituality, things like this, and how after a conversation a, an action will be initiated. So when I was um, in my 20s at some point, uh, I decided that I wanted to meet my grandfather. So my mother's narrative in the house was always that we weren't Kennedys, that we were actually Saxes. And that's because my father was adopted at three-ish area of timeline from a man named Bill Kennedy. And, um, but prior to that, like, we are the offspring of Frank Donald Sachs. And, um, so to, that was always kind of known <clears throat> that we were, you know, we were Kennedys, yes, but we were Saxes. And, um, and so I'd never met this man. He showed up when my brother was born. Um, he showed up a couple of times before and drew my dad one day and, um, in charcoal. So that drawing was around in my father's bedroom, um, laminated and safe. This is this, this drawing of my papa that made him look like Jesus. And, uh, it was pretty funny. We'd laugh about it because my dad has long hair and big beard and he was, you know, his head was down and in a sorrowful kind of motion, thoughtful, any which way. And, um, and so then in, yeah, sometime, back. I want I want the date, but I don't have it. Um, I had it down to, to, my desire was to meet him. Um, some people in our family don't believe he has any right to know any of us, um, because he left, um, went for milk and cigarettes and never came back kind of thing, left my granny with three kids. And so we're very proud Kennedys, you know, because Kennedy is the, the father, the dad, you know, um, that kind of thing. So I decided that I wanted to meet this man, and that's a big one of mine, um, is that seeing a person and making my own judgments about their choices that they made in the past. And um, so I called up my dad finally and asked him if he had his number, and it turned out he was actually in Edmonton, and I was living in Edmonton at that time, and been there for a couple of weeks, they were camping, you know, 80-year-olds camping, um, tells you a bit about my grandpa, and... Uh, and they were outside Edmonton, just camping. They'd been there for a bit. And so I had about a week where I was mad. I was mad nobody gave me the option to choose whether or not I wanted to meet my grandfather or, or whatnot. So it took me, took me about a week to be like comfortable approaching that. And so then I contacted him and called him and I said, Hi there, you know, Frank Donald Sachs. This is uh, your granddaughter from Lori. Lori and uh, here I am kind of thing. And uh, he'd never heard of me. <laughs> I've met my, both of my brothers and my dad a couple occasions, but never heard of me, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that was interesting. And so then we turned out they were leaving the next day. And, and I had a ride to California because I understood from my aunt that they lived in California. So I organized a ride and I was set to go down to California in about three weeks. And my plan was to find him. So this was interesting to actually go for lunch with him before showing up at his doorstep. Probably a good good cue from the universe, um, considering I didn't know where the heck they were or how big California was. Um, yeah, so met them for lunch. Uh, my grandfather was a priest in the Anglican Church, but a very strange one. They were ordained as gadflies first, which was this order that dissected Carlos Castellos' books and like put together these really interesting... Um, symbols and charts about the universe and, and things like this. So really interesting um, engineer um, and lived had lived up in uh, Old Crow in the north for 10 years kind of thing. So very, very, it was like breathing. Like I've never met anyone <laughs> that was so me in so many ways. And it was just like, oh, it was just amazing. We had an amazing, amazing lunch and really just wow conversation and and then my step grandmother um my grandma grandma lee she uh, she said the magic words like you know oh if you're ever in california want to come visit you know and i was like oh, actually i have i have a, a ride 
there in uh, three weeks. So if you tell me where you live, I've got, I'll have get to San Fran. And turns out it's quite a distance from San Fran to, um, to, to where they live in California, which is Banning, which is known for its largest jail, which I didn't, I didn't know that. And they live really close to, it's really near uh, 29 Palms, one of the biggest military bases in California. So I uh, was getting all sorts of cool like camo stuff and like good quality um, military gear. Not really thinking much of it, but lots of lots of uh, thrift stores in the middle of nowhere with really, you know, barely used um, military gear. So I had a couple of things that ordained me and I had my dog and got into San Fran and then headed down to Long Beach. It took me four days to do seven hours because people don't hitchhike in the States. Um, tried to hop a train. That was a couple of days of useless, ridiculous, and uh, didn't get didn't get anywhere. And so I decided to, to hitch and tried that. And yeah, it was four days, four days to do seven hours. Um, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting trip that started with a beautiful art gallery in the middle of Big Sur. And I walked in and there was this woman, the, art, the primary artist, and she had a big streak of, of skunk in her black hair. And she was such a tarantula. Like, it was just like, boom, like tarantula. And I, and I was like, whoa, like a tarantula. And she was like, oh, yeah, I just seen one the other day on a path, you know. And she has this beautiful art show. And then she had this wild, wild artist in the back who was like, Mm -hmm. and like and uh, lines on corrugated cardboard with circles with like the alignments of the planets and the incoming of the the Palladians and da -da 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 -da. and I had uh, I had collected a feather and had a feather in my hair from the first first week coming down getting called Lily Coyote by my uh, my <laughs> my ride my ride and uh, I didn't realize that my behaviors would have been considered horrific to the woman that was in, in the passenger seat because nothing was said, so I just continued to be me on the ride down and hugged, found this feather. And, and so she looked at me and she told me that it was, was a condor feather, that it wasn't an eagle feather, and that it was, um, that it was condor, it was vulture. And she proceeded to look me in the eyes and be like, the jaguar comes down on its victim through the cranium. The only one who does that. Just like a scorpion. If you make a circle of fire around him, he will check every point for an exit. And if there is none, he'll reach over and sting himself in the back and commit suicide. So it's this beautiful art gallery, interesting teachings. Um, that was at the far end of the gallery. Sat with some of the pieces and, and proceeded to go find a, a tree to sleep on in the Big Sur. And Quist wanted to, to roam. She wanted to go out because there's wolves and there's all sorts of smells. So I actually had to leash her and and she was pouting and sleeping separate from me at first. But then it got chilly and a little bit kind of just the night, I guess. And then she came and snugged in and wanted me to spoon her. So that was awesome. So me and Quist slept there. It was all right night. I think she got a tick in, uh, while we were in the woods there. So that was a bit of a bummer. We found a tick when we got down um, into Banning, but so then the first morning I woke up, I was walking and I was collecting messages from the forest and just experiencing the forest and, and I found this beautiful stick and was enjoying this stick and, and, uh, looking at all these things. And then two yellow slugs came crawling very, very slowly in front of my path. And I was like, oh, boo, it's going to be slow travel. And sure enough, it was. I got some, had some amazing rides. Uh, one gentleman gave me an avocado, an onion, and a habanero. And uh, so that was my, my breakfast at one stage. It was pretty intense, but the combination worked. Like, the avocado was able to, like, mellow the habanero, and, like, the onion in comparison to the habanero wasn't, like, you know, it was all, like, bam, 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 really intense. But uh, it was, like, a detox on the road kind of thing, I guess. And... Uh, and then I got in, I got, my one of my last stops was a gentleman um, who was a little bit creepy, not too bad, but, uh, you know, made him dinner, sleeping on the couch kind of thing. He kept on offering me to sleep in the bed, and he'd sleep on the couch, this and that. And I was like, I know that one. They're like, no. That is. So me and my dog just, you know, cozied up on the couch, just put her in my nook, and slept on this little tiny couch, and 
In the morning, this gent proceeded to tell me he wanted to take me to Disneyland and Disney World or whatever the hell it is there. Show me a good time and this and that. And I was like, yep, we'll see you later. I'm going on, heading to see my grandpa. That's what I'm here to do, thanks. And, uh, and so he dropped me off in the morning at like 6 a.m. on one of the freeways. And I got a ride right away. And I was in the ride. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll drop you off at exit 10. And I was like, yeah, come, yeah. I know, fuck all. Like, I'm just heading there. That's where I'm going. As long as it's got a good shoulder, I'm happy. Like, I don't even know, right? So I'm outside of Long Beach and um, getting a ride to this exit 10. But as we're going, he gets a little weird, asks some inappropriate questions kind of thing. Then not obviously inappropriate, but when you've hitchhiked a lot and been around a lot, you can tell when something's a fringe question. So there were some fringe questions happening. And I was just sitting in my boundary of like, no, 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 you know, trying to get my grandpa. That's what we're doing. And, uh, and then as we got closer to exit 10, um, something inside of me started to freak out and I started to panic and I started to like, feel like this wasn't okay. This wasn't safe. This is something bad is going to happen. It's kind of feelings. And I started to like escalate. And then I was like, no, 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 no. And I was like, take me back. Take me back, take me back, take me back, take me back now. And I started waking out um, really intensely. And this guy was like, no, no, it's all good. Exit 10, exit 10. And I was like, no, no, this is a no. This is a fucking no. I don't know why. I don't understand what, but this is a no. So I got him to take me back to where he picked me up. And I went and, uh, and I just stayed on the phone with a friend until the sun rose. Because it was a couple hours till the sun had come up. And so, yeah, so I talked on the phone and then went back out and got a ride. And I got a ride with a gentleman who was complaining that his name was Yari and they'd named a vehicle after that. And then he was a soccer guy, he had his lip, wife's lips tattooed on his neck and he had, you know, his son's hand print on his, on his forearm. And he was a really, really lovely fellow. And he really reminded me of my brother, my older brother, because he plays a lot of soccer and it's a great dad and things like that. And then he's, yeah, bitching about this business of this car, new efficient car called the Yari, and it's named after him, and blah, 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 blah. And uh, so I got dropped off in Long Beach, and it was still quite early. And so I was, you know, sunbathing, just enjoying the beach, and, and I stripped off my, my pants at one point, was walking around in a pair of, like, little boys' underwear, and, and, uh, and then picking up garbage, just picking up garbage. And then a few times I sat, and I put my shirt up, and it was just sunning, sunning the girls a little bit on a completely empty beach, just not, not thinking about anything. And then, yeah, walking around in a, in a pretty much full t-shirt with, with a pair of underwear on and, and picking up garbage and talking to a heron, things like this, <laughs> just having, having a nice time, waiting until it seemed like an appropriate hour to call my grandparents and let them know that I had arrived in California and come to, come to meet them for a second time. And, um, yeah, then I was there, just doing my thing, lounging with my dog, and I got surrounded by a bunch of officers with, with guns out. It was pretty intense. It was pretty fucking weird. Um, I think t there was two. There might have been three. Um, don't quite exactly recall. And, uh, yeah, I was tripped out. I never had a gun pulled on me before. So that was really, like, a weird, weird experience. I totally didn't even think about the fact that, like, officers in the States have firearms. Um, and that there's a good chance you do, too, you know? Because, fucking buy one at the fucking corner store. And, uh, and so that was really trippy. And they threatened to shoot Quist. And I was just like, whoa, like, chill out. Like, holy fuck, like, tie my dog, relax. Like, it's all good. And I got frizzed really, like, inappropriately, and that was uncomfortable. So the other other human watched, and I, and I stated that, I, you know, I am a female. I deserve a female officer if I'm going to be frisked, thanks. And that was just completely ignored. And, uh, and all of my stuff got pulled out and thrown all over the ground, and just, like, very strange, very strange interaction. And I was just like, oh, welcome to California. Yeah, you know, that's me getting arrested for indecent exposure on a beach. And uh, so they didn't arrest me. There was nothing. I was clothed when they arrived. They had gotten a call about something, about something. 
And I explained, you know, I'd been picking up garbage and just waiting to call my grandparents, actually. And uh, so then I, I kind of freaked out a little bit after they left. I was a little intense. Cried a little bit and just, like, had a, like, you know, a little bit of a meltdown. And then went to the phone and sucked it all in and called them. And they showed up and I was just all hunky-dory. I didn't mention that because, you know, they don't know who I am. And here I am, like, oh, yeah, you know. So, so I just left that out and uh, hung out with them for a month and a half. And we went, uh, I think we were in, people were in Afghanistan at that time. It was like that, that's happening was happening. And um, so we were discussing that at the, at the lunch, lunch afternoon brainstorm session that we would have after we'd eat. And we were discussing, like, yeah, just war and things like that. And then we went out to this, this uh, church near the the military base and my grandfather gave this beautiful sermon on uh, on war and this and that and World War Two and Afghanistan and, and just a pretty anti anti-war talk for a, a priest to be hired randomly to come out to a military base and do a conversation and when he was done it was like crickets and then this one woman just stood up and just was like clapping and clapping and so that was awesome uh, my grandpa I was like fuck yeah it's my fucking grandpa bam bringing it and then uh, we went out to some place called needles in the middle of nowhere again just random random hired their priest was sick you know and so my grandpa came and and uh I showed up and I had my dog and, and my, mili my army pants and my ugly hair and just very uh, interesting looking human to be coming in with the, with the priest and the deacon. And I sat down and then at tea, we had a lovely tea and I can, I can speak about the Abrahamic faiths. So I've been around, you know, I believe in understanding the things that you don't necessarily agree with. So I've spent quite a bit of time um, entering... Um, you know, Mormon churches and Jehovah Witness churches and born again Christian churches in my teen years, just um, going in with this open, open heart as if I had been raised like this. This is my belief. This is my truth. This is my community. And just entering for going for about a week, a couple weeks, um, and just observing, observing. So there is things I can speak to as far as as the Abrahamic faith go. So, and that's my grandfather. So his sermon would also make some sense to me in a variety of ways and so a nice lovely tea time quist wandered around got cookies and said hello because she's her own dog do whatever she want and amazing just another human in the in the crew just a fluffier one and uh and then ever since that that i guess every time they went out to needles which was pretty rare um they would bring up me and quist and and ask about things so my grandfather wrote a sermon about going to that to that um uh, to that place and he prepared this sermon for the second time he went after I was already gone and he wrote about how there was you know everything was going on Sunday mornings everybody's in the pews this and that and then a jaguar leaps into the center of the church Boom, and everybody Wah! And runs out and, <laughs> and um, runs away and then the next week the jaguar is at the front doing communion with the priest then uh, and then we were there and we were discussing things and we, some of the shooting crises was going on um, at the time. And so we were discussing the culture of violence and um, ban banning guns versus not banning guns, different aspects of politics, different things like this. And, uh, and then we discussed mostly like the culture of violence and so how the, we have to initiate the change from the culture of violence and how much um, death we're ingesting in a day. You know, and that that at a basic level, that even just the word "dead" and in it in initiates aggression from humans towards other humans at a level of politics. So we were discussing that, and he wrote a short little editorial and sent it into the newspaper, and it made it into the newspaper. So we have that newspaper cutting. So one of the things that I really appreciate and think that is in the lineage of my purple book um, is that a peacekeeper, and it is that of of this spirit bridger to a certain extent, but also in the purple of, of Don Sachs, there is the narrative of the abandoned child. Um, and in the purple 
is the is the rage at the one who left um, and the, the intergenerational muck of, of that abandonment moment and in the purple of that yeah there's just lots of family stuff and then and then yeah this intelligence um, but also this humility um, and yeah, so I think that when I think of purple and I think of my purple book, um, the first thing that comes up is is Frank Donald Sachs. Um, he's my beautiful grandfather I didn't know until 2007 and um, was blessed to know during that time just because there was so much action, there was so much initiation, there was so much drive to do something change the world.